It's so quiet in here, it feels like a library. <laughs> uh, are there any librarians here? What? I, see, I see one arriving now. <laughs> when I first spoke uh, to uh, Dr. Hayton, uh, I told her that uh, many librarians from the region would be here. And she said, great, I'd love for my librarian peeps to be here. Uh, there are many people we know are uh, on their way, but there's a traffic problem on 64, so they will be delayed. Uh, one of our speakers uh, is coming in from uh, West Virginia State, so uh, she may or may not make it. Um, before we bring on Dr. Hayden, uh, please allow me to tell you a couple of things about the Carter G. Whitson Lyceum. Uh, it was created two years ago, and our name honors Dr. Whitson, the father of black history, a former West Virginia coal miner, principal at the former Douglas High School in Huntington, uh, where he also received his high school diploma. Uh, Aristotle's first school in 335 BC was called the Lyceum. Abraham Lincoln's first public speech attacking slavery and the mob violence that led to the death of abolitionist editor Elijah Lovejoy was delivered at the Lyceum in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, please note, we also have created a Maple Grove Society whose members support the Woodson Lyceum's programs. Uh, please visit our site and learn more about it and several of our programs at www.marshall.edu slash Woodson Lyceum. <clears throat> when you tweet, please also include at Woodson Lyceum. <laughs> I could tell you about another great, another great Lyceum at Ole Miss, but our next speaker is an alumnus of Mississippi State University. And you can read between the lines. <laughs> I won't go there, although I did, but I won't go there now. Uh, Dr. Gilbert. Good afternoon. I want to thank all of you for being here at the annual Carter G. Woodson Lecture. Uh, we are incredibly honored uh, to have Dr. Hayden as our special guest lecturer here today. In addition to leading our nation's library, she is a pioneer of sorts in that she is the first woman and also the first African American to serve as a librarian of Congress, and I think that deserves an applause. I think it is very fitting to have her at Marshall as part of our celebration of Black History Month and also to celebrate the life and scholarship of Huntington's own Carter G. Woodson. So I welcome you to Marshall University and to Huntington, Dr. Hayden, and it is indeed our pleasure to have you here. We look forward to hearing from you in a minute. I want to thank Senator Shelley Moore Capito and Congressman Evan Jenkins for being here. Uh, Shelley and Evans, you are always so supportive of Marshall and we truly appreciate that. Also, a round of applause. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Hayden's mother who traveled to Huntington uh, with her. We're so glad to have you with us today. And I want to thank Dr. Montserrat Miller and Professor Bernice Morris for all their work for putting on this event uh, today. We're very excited and we're very appreciative. Thank you. Uh, Steve Williams is serving in his second term as mayor of Huntington. Uh, he has been a strong supporter of the Woodson Lyceum from its inception. Uh, please welcome Mayor Williams. Dr. Hayden, we are thrilled to have you visiting Huntington, West Virginia. 
Uh, thank you for the compliment of coming to Marshall University. We are the home of Carter G. Woodson. Um, and uh, what Marshall University uh, brings, and frankly, with Dr. Woodson being from Huntington, one thing that uh, we came to realize, since he is the founder of Black History Month, this city, this university has to own Black History Month. But we are certainly thrilled that you were able to, to, to come to Huntington. It was just announced today that the Bloomberg Philanthropies have what they call the Mayor's Challenge, identifying uh, cities around the, the country who are seeking to uh, identify solutions to problems, any problem that is uh, permeating our society in Huntington, West Virginia was named one of 35 cities in, in the country today to be a, what we call a, a champion city. The other cities are Ithaca, New York, Lincoln, Nebraska, Los Angeles, Louisville, uh, Kentucky, uh, Oklahoma City, Phoenix, Arizona, Princeton, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., to, to name a few, and Huntington is listed uh, right in, in, in that. What we'd like to say is that uh, Dr. Woodson proved that you can get there from here. He changed the world uh, from Appalachia. He changed the world from Huntington, West Virginia, and his roots run deep here. That's why we pay tribute to, to him, and uh, he certainly is a favored and favorite son, but we are so proud to be able to have you as our visitor uh, these two days, and thank you for the warm weather that you brought with you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Montserrat Miller is Executive Director of the John Deaver Drinko Academy. The Drinko Academy has served as an incubator for the Lyceum, and we're happy to have her support as well as the Drinko Academies. Uh, Dr. Miller is a social historian, but I've also heard reference to her as a food historian. Uh, Dr. Miller. The John Deaver Drinko Academy is honored to collaborate with the Carter G. Woodson Lyceum to host Dr. Carla Hayden's visit to our beautiful campus. I'm sure that our audience today will all agree that Professor Morris has scored a major coup in securing a visit to Marshall University on the part of the 14th Librarian of Congress. Dr. Hayden, is tremendously well regarded among librarians and the public more generally, of course, as a consummate professional, as quite possibly the most qualified individual to ever serve as the librarian of Congress. <laughs> wonderful. And also, I must say, as a symbol of hope for our society's commitment to a system of meritocracy in public service. Thank you very much. Evan Jenkins uh, represents the 3rd Congressional District of West Virginia. He is a native of Huntington in 1994. No, I'm sorry. He is a native of Huntington. He's, he's a bit older than... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Congressman, I tried to help. In, in 1994, Mr. Jenkins was elected to serve in the West Virginia House of Delegates, where he represented Cabell and Wayne counties uh, for three terms. In 2002, he was elected to the West Virginia Senate, where he served another three terms, after which he was elected to the United States House of Representatives. Mr. Jenkins has a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the University of Florida and a Juris Doctor from the Cumberland School of Law at Stanford University. He previously served as the Executive Director of the West Virginia State Medical Association and taught business law at, Miss, at Marshall University. He and his wife, Elizabeth, live in Huntington with three children, and I should add that uh, Congressman Jenkins' office has been very supportive of the Lyceum, uh, has attended all of our major functions. And we thank you, Congressman, and please welcome him. Thank you. 
with that kind introduction, it makes me feel like I have to give a whole speech. And I was going to take uh, the lead from Dr. Gilbert and the good mayor and keep it short. So let's keep it short. I had the honor over these uh, last couple of years to actually get to know Dr. Hayden. And so I'm certainly not going to steal the wonderful thunder of our wonderful Senator Capito, who gets to more formally introduce her. But uh, one of the very special things that we get to do in Congress is uh, the Library of Congress hosts, usually on a monthly or every two months basis, an event where people get to come together, Democrats, Republicans, House, Senates. If you wonder if we ever work together, we sure do. But it's really in her house at the Library of Congress. And I've had the honor of getting to know Dr. Hayden. What a special lady. And I know from the pitch of the cheers about, let's hear it for the librarians, it really is pretty special. And to echo the comments about well-qualified, just think, a bunch of white guys for 200 years as the librarians of Congress that probably didn't have much, uh, quite the caliber of accomplishments that Dr. Hayden has. She truly is an incredible woman, so accomplished in all facets of her life. And we truly are so blessed to have her come and be with us. You know, Steve and I served in the state legislature. Uh, Judy Rule and other librarians uh, we know very well. Uh, I tell you, you all are special to us. And just on a personal note, I do serve on the House Appropriations Committee, and a lot of people don't know it, but within the Interior Subcommittee, which I serve on, uh, through uh, the Park Service, we actually help fund historic black colleges and universities around the country, tens of millions of dollars. And while Marshall is not, Bluefield State is in the 3rd Congressional District. So we are so appreciative of our historic black colleges and universities, we are so incredibly appreciative of the Library of Congress, but most importantly, we are appreciative of the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Hayes. Thank you so much. Shelley Moore Capito was elected to the United States Senate in 2014. She is the first female United States Senator in West Virginia history. She previously represented West Virginia's second congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives for 14 years and served as a member of the West Virginia House of Delegates for four years. She was born in Glendale in the Northern Panhandle. She received a Bachelor of Science degree in Zoology from Duke University and a Master of Education from the University of Virginia. She and her husband, Charles uh, Capito, reside in Charleston. They have three children, three adult children. Please welcome United States Senator Shelley Capito. Thank you, for Pre Professor Morris. Where'd he go? Right oh, there he is. <laughs> well, boy, that was quick. Um, and good afternoon to everybody. It is a real treat for me. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Gilbert and Marshall University, Professor Morris at the uh, Car Carter G. Woodson Lyceum for inviting uh, Dr. Hayden to come and be our guest today. I put the heavy press on her after that. Um, and we're going to have an, an, another really nice day in West Virginia tomorrow. But this is going to be the highlight of her visit, getting to see uh, Marshall, getting to see the roots of uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, and, and getting to meet all of you. And I'm going to go off script here a little bit and take a, take a little um, uh, leap of faith here, but uh, Dr. Hayden is a librarian's librarian, and you all are in for a big treat to hear her. You really are. She is uh, a fantastic speaker. She's well thought of on Capitol Hill. She's well thought of in the community of librarians and uh, educators. Uh, it's just a, a thrill for me to really get to know her and get to meet her mom, too. I, I'm, I'm very pleased. I've, we've, we've met on a couple of occasions. And uh, I know that uh, she's a critical partner as the librarian of Congress to Congress. Uh, I think uh, what uh, it's the largest library in the world uh, with all, obviously tremendous sources of knowledge, but also the library also houses the Congressional Research Service, which helps us research 
uh, information for us to make all of the informed decisions that we make. Okay, guys, come on, that was, a, that was, you can laugh at that, I mean. <laughs> but Dr. Hayden and her team helped my staff and all of our staff, Congressman, Congressman Jenkins and others on Capitol Hill, to become informed and, and serve not just West Virginians, but the rest of the nation uh, effectively and efficiently, and I can't thank you enough for that. Um, so it is fitting that Dr. Hayden is here to celebrate the father of Black History Month, as we've heard many uh, previous speakers say. Um, I think it bears repeating that not only is she the first African American, but she's the first woman who is the, can I say that again? <laughs> Before that, Dr. Hayden held uh, numerous positions at, at the Chicago Public Library, the M Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Uh, she taught at the University of Pittsburgh, and her, her last assignment was at, at the Enoch Pratt uh, Library, Free Library in Baltimore. Now, when describing um, during the Freddie Gray protests in 2015, which were in Baltimore, if you remember that, Dr. Hayden made a decision, a very courageous decision, by the way, to keep the Baltimore libraries open. Remember, the whole city was closing in, including a branch at the center of the protests. All week, this library served as a refuge, a place that provided comfort to so many. And I also heard that your mom came in and helped out. Uh, Dr. Hayden explained how so many rely on the library for a lot of things. Uh, for their daily in their daily lives and a lot of connectivity to the to the rest of the world So thank you dr. Hayden for your courage in that I think it shows the courage that you're going to have to lead uh, our Library of Congress and uh, I'm just gonna say I was able to attend her swearing-in uh, She's much as I said much beloved. I think your appointment went through faster than grease lightning. I mean it was like <laughs> She's incredible, but she says uh, number one, she gave credit to her mom for, for giving her her love of reading, so thank you for that. Uh, and she also says that the library is one of the greatest gifts and legacy the Congress has given to the American people. The vision of a national library to serve members of Congress and the communities they represent continues the legacy of my, her, 13 predecessors. Over time, these leaders have expanded the scope of materials collected advocated successfully to bring the federal copyright system here, and one by one oversee construction of the facilities necessary to house and preserve the collections and the services offered here. You are a visionary for tomorrow, for, the, for our, uh, most, one of our most prized possessions, uh, the Library of Congress, so it's my honor and pleasure to present to you the 14th Librarian of Congress. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much. And, and, and before, there's so many people to thank, but I, have, I appreciate you mentioning my mom. Um, when people talk about the courage and, and what happened in Baltimore, I, I mentioned though that I had a, some trepidation because the branch library was right, right in the epicenter. And when the call came that the librarians wanted to open the next day. I knew I had to be there. And the only hesitation I had was telling my mom. Uh, she's an avid watcher of the news. She saw the burning car. She knew that. And so like any uh, young person or uh, with a mother, um, I waited until the 10 minutes before I left <laughs> to tell her. So I wouldn't face anything, and the only thing she said was, people will need water, and you should take some napkins. <laughs> and by two days later, she was at the information desk with fruit and answering questions. So I have to thank her for me uh, even being here today. And, And, it's, and it is truly an honor to be here um, and my personal and um, professional connections to Dr. Woodson are something that I also shared with the first speaker uh, last year, Dr. 
uh, Earl Lewis, the president of the Mellon Foundation, who was provost at Emory University when it purchased uh, some of Mr. Woodson's uh, papers. And I'll tell you, the Library of Congress purchased just the other parts. <laughs> To University President Dr. Jerome Gilbert, who I had the pleasure of sitting with um, last night, thank you very much. I did not make the mistake of saying uh, Mississippi State versus uh, Ole Miss, <laughs> so I was just there, but thank you so much. Uh, Congressman Jenkins, you know how much the dialogues mean to Congress, and you have attended. And what the dialogues do, is provide the same safe haven, the same place to be together and hear ideas that libraries throughout every community on every campus, the same thing that they do, the Library of Congress does it for Congress, and we appreciate you coming. And of course, Senator Capitol, you were one of the first people that I met during the rounds that you make meeting senators, and I appreciate your toughness uh, in some of your questions and also your support, and I really appreciate that. Uh, Mayor Williams, congratulations. That's something because I had just complimented you on having one of the best downtowns that I've seen from the donut shop <laughs> to the place where I bought my blouse, all of that. It's vital, Pullman Square. I wanted to go to the movies. It, it really was something so Thank you. Um, and faculty and staff at Marshall, and um, also the members of the West Virginia Library community. I can't thank you enough. You may know, Senator, and I think I might have mentioned that in my interview, but every library association in the United States, every state library association, sent a letter of support. And I am forever grateful. And thank you, uh, West Virginia. Now, when I was invited to be here, uh, one of the Library of Congress staffers, who's a proud alum of Marshall, said that I must say, go herd. <laughs> so, and I wouldn't have been able to go back uh, to DC. And it is such a privilege to be part of Marshall University's Black History Month celebration with a special emphasis on Dr. Carter G. Woodson. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Alan Gould last night, who I understand was dedicated to making sure Carter G. Woodson and his ties to Huntington were recognized and celebrated. And I want to take this time to publicly express my deep appreciation to Professor Morris for making sure that the intellectual and professional legacy of Dr. Woodson continues. Thank you for inviting me. Now, it's been noted that I'm making history as the first female um, in the what's been called one of the four feminized professions, uh, social work, education, nursing, and librarianship, where 85% of the workforce is female. So yes, that was significant. And the library community, we're still celebrating. Uh, <laughs> we have that. Um, I am the third librarian. Uh, my two predecessors as librarians uh, were directors of the Cleveland Public Library and also the Boston, Boston Public Library, but I'm the first librarian in 70 years. But it was my personal, uh, really, privilege of being the first African American to head up the world's largest library, the symbol in this country of net education, knowledge, and the power of information to be an African American was particularly significant. Uh, as I was preparing my uh, remarks, and, and Senator Capito gave some of them, there was one part that I said that being a descendant of people who were denied the right to read, who were punished, and I must tell you, and I've, uh, this is public knowledge, I was planning on at that same 
swearing in, listing all of the laws. And as a good librarian, I did research. <laughs> and I went back. And it was everything from amputation, uh, one finger at a time, uh, the number of whips, each state, uh, people who taught slaves to read were punished. And after my mom said, that would be a downer, Carla. <laughs> Uh, can we wrap that up into a nice statement? Uh, I made that point that that was the real significance of someone of color uh, having that role. And I also know that it's almost overwhelming to think of the little girl who at seven or eight found the book Bright April that a young lady just brought to show me, and I showed others, that the, was the first time I saw myself in a book, something that was so important, that I would be standing there as the 14th Librarian of Congress was truly significant. Now, when um, I thought about uh, being Librarian of Congress, though, and, and, and it's hard to believe I did think about it, it wasn't just automatic, because I had been in public uh, libraries and public service, and I had an interview with then President Obama. And if any of you, and there, I know there are a lot of students here, and you're graduating, you're thinking about interviews. Don't worry. If your first interview is not with the President of the United States, <laughs> think about that. <laughs> but he he uh, he said I was able to view as President the draft of the Declaration of Independence written in Thomas Jefferson's hand with notes on the side that said BF, Benjamin Franklin, JA, John Adams, in his own hand where they crossed out the word subjects and put in citizens. I was able to see the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets the night he was assassinated that included uh, not only a Confederate five note, because he'd just been there, but also a button that he had put in his pocket. And when you think about how that humanizes someone, you lose a, that. He said, but I think, and so many other historic documents, he said, but I think I saw a lot of those things because of my title and who I am. He said, what could you do as Librarian of Congress to make these types of things accessible to everyone? And then he asked, would I serve as the Librarian of Congress? And then I was hooked, because that was a way to serve. And yes, that library holds the largest collections of maps, the comic books, founding documents, the papers of 23 presidents, the works of uh, Americans such as Samuel Morris, Clara Barton, Thurgood Marshall, Frederick Douglass, and yes, Huntington's own Carter G. Woodson. And what I had the opportunity to do is to think about what I could bring to it. And African American history and Carter G. Woodson was a major part of my own professional life. When I started out at the Chicago Public Library, I was fortunate to work at the first regional library, and it was the Carter G. Woodson Regional Library. My connection, and one of my first tasks, though, that brings me full circle to Library of Congress, was we had to file and put in a card catalog over a million Library of Congress <laughs> card sets. <laughs> a room just like this was, was filled. That's when I really, though, learned about Carter G. Woodson. Because, as you know, he founded Negro History Week, as it was called, in 1926. And that week proved so influential that it turned into a month. And let me just say that it, the month of February was chosen, not because it's the shortest month. <laughs> it was because of the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln on February the 12th, that those were the, the seminal dates. And in Professor Morris's book, and I can't help it, I brought a copy of it to show, um, 
Carter G. Woodson, History, the Black Press, and Public Relations. What people might not have realized is he was an activist, but also a remarkable person who realized the power of public relations and the power of the press. And at that time, that was an important vehicle in getting black history out there. Now, I must tell you that many of us have had experience, of course, with Black History Month, and we know uh, different things. When I asked my mom, I asked her about, well, this is a, a real confession. Uh, when I uh, was growing up, we didn't have much black history, but we had American history and blacks were involved with slavery. So I promptly went home and asked her how she felt when Lincoln freed the slaves. Because <laughs> I figured she would know. Uh, <laughs> And she corrected me and said, well, not then, but later on. And as I got more involved, especially at the Carter G. Woodson Regional Library, where we, we really knew more about him, um, she mentioned that growing up in the, I guess I could say late 30s, early 40s, when they had American history and they knew that the Civil War was coming up and slavery was going to be mentioned, they skipped school because they were so ashamed, because that was the only thing that they knew about American history that had African Americans in them. And when you think about what we are now celebrating now in terms of black history and Carter Woodson's legacy, it is truly significant. Now I mentioned that um, the Library of Congress has one of the largest collections of materials given by Carter G. Woodson. And so here I am with that collection and starting out uh, at the Carter G. Woodson uh, Library. And in 1928, the eighth librarian of Congress, Herbert Putnam, and he was from the Putnam Publishing Company, agreed to accept Carter Woodson's collection. Now this was two years after 1928, 1926 after, um, Dr. Woodson started Black uh, Negro History Month uh, week. And the then librarian, and I have a letter from uh, Librarian Putnam that accepted uh, Carter Woodson's desire to have African American materials at the Library of Congress, but he also expressed doubt that Carter Woodson could deliver. Now, someone said, Carly, you're not going to mention that, but it's already in Professor Morris's book. <laughs> so it's in there. And he even put a copy of the letter from the Library of Congress. Well, years went by, and we certainly have seen that uh, Dr. Woodson kept his promise to give a significant collection. And now the papers span the years from 1736 to 1974. Uh, and we, the library has added to the papers. And the papers were assembled, the initial papers, as an outgrowth of his interest in collecting and preserving primary sources. And it gives a detailed account of black history, including the appointment of African Americans to federal office, race relations, racial discrimination, and it also has primary documents relating to the slavery area, including bills of sale, certificates of freedom, and free colored leisures. And the collection also includes correspondence between Carter G. Woodson and other prominent African American scholars, including W.E.B. Du Bois and the Library of Congress's own Daniel A. Murray. Now, Daniel A. Murray was the first, quote, professional library worker at the Library of Congress. And he remained at the library for over 45 years. And although he was, and this is uh, in a recent book, denied promotional uh, opportunities, because at that time at the Library of Congress, it was not deemed uh, fit that an African American could manage uh, people of another race. 
he remained at the library and started collecting materials. And these materials form the basis of what is now one of the most significant collection of materials about African Americans. He invited a young student, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, to be a library assistant, and he compiled books and pamphlets by black authors that were in the 1900 Paris Exposition, and that formed the nucleus. And he also has recently been given an honor, and I had the honor, and when you think about synergies, to present Nobel Prize winning author Toni Morrison's program called A Bench by the Road, and her foundation gives actual benches with a placard that celebrate African Americans. And a few months ago, I was able to cut the ribbon on the bench in front of the Library of Congress for Daniel A. Murray. And his grandson, great-grandson, sent a letter. And I just wanted to read just a little bit about it. He found out about, in three days, in visiting Washington, D.C., I found my great-grandfather's grave, and it happened to be on Columbus Day. And then I came to the Library of Congress and found out that there was going to be a ceremony for him, and that the first African-American woman in charge of the Library of Congress would be there. And so I went. I had just met my great-grandfather through his work, the same happened to me with my father when he passed away in 2003. Not because of what he taught me, namely because of what people knew about him or told me. And then he says, I am sure my great-grandfather, wherever he might be, is proud to know that with this long period of time, finally, we have a chance to make a difference. I would like to quote James Baldwin who said, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it. History is literally present in all that we do. Thank you for honoring my great grandfather. Now, Daniel Murray and Carter G. Woodson both had the idea of publishing the first Encyclopedia Africana. And they, at different times, worked on that, and they ran into insurmountable odds with funding. But finally, and we are all here to benefit from that, those obstacles were overcome, and Dr. Henry Louis Gates has now published that, that encyclopedia. So the contributions of Carter G. Woodson, Daniel Murray, and many librarians in the past, when you think of Mr. Schomburg, who started the collection at New York Public, Vivian G. Harsh, who started the collection that resides in Chicago at the uh, Carter Woodson Library. They were pioneers. And although the collections at the Library of Congress are vast, what you won't notice is a separate African-American department, and that's due to Dr. Woodson's legacy and inspiration. He felt that as we celebrate black history and all of the contributions, we should also know that black history is American history and it, it should be a part of it and it should be woven throughout. And so at the Library of Congress, the treasures that we have related to African-American history and culture, such as the manuscripts of musicians Max Roach and Billy Strayhorn, the papers of the activists Mary Church Terrell and Bernard Rustin, the archives of the Pullman Porters, the photographs of Gordon Parks, the archives of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the most heavily used collection in the entire Library of Congress collection, the archives of the Legal Defense Fund and the NAACP, still happening, are interwoven throughout the library. Now we're working hard to make sure that they are accessible online and the collection of Rosa Parks is now digitized and, and fully available. But the legacy 
of Dr. Woodson permeates. And people have asked, why don't you just have a black history uh, section in the library? But I'm very proud to say that we have made it. This is America's library, and the contributions of African Americans are throughout. Now, we do have specialists uh, in African American history that are at the Library of Congress, and we have special resources, and you can do that. And one specialist, Ms. Adrian Cannon, started, and she's still here after 40 or so years at the library, because she had roots in West Virginia. And her mother told her about her relative, Carter Woodson. And so she got interested in finding out the history. She became a librarian, and that's how she got started. And now, Ms. Adrian Cannon is the specialist for African American history and culture at the Library of Congress. She's in your book, <laughs> Professor Morris. And she said she never thought finding out about her relative, Carter G. Woodson, would lead her to being the person who helped negotiate some of the uh, arrangements for making sure that the Carter G. Woodson archive would be available at the Library of Congress, and she is touching those things now. I recently had an opportunity to Skype with teen students from Harrisonburg, Virginia, and it was an after-school uh, program, and it was for Black History Month and their eyes widened as Ms. Cannon, who's a specialist, showed them so many treasures from the collections. And they saw dispatch instructions from Rosa Parks. I'm sure many of you know about Ms. Parks and, and what she's famous for, but did you know that she was an early Uber uh, <laughs> dispatcher <laughs> with and in her own hand are the instructions for the different drivers during the bus boycott. And she was telling them to have patience and all of that. And so the kids, when, when Ms. Cannon made that connection with Uber, that, that, that was something. <laughs> when they saw the letter from Jackie Robinson to Dr. Martin Luther King, it, they couldn't really believe that. And then the photos of a young congressman Mr. John Lewis, and when he had a backpack on, getting ready to go to jail with some books and just some other things, but he knew he'd been there, that it made uh, history come alive. And we have an opportunity now to, at this moment in time, to have young people touch history and make it come alive. The best thing that's happened to uh, American history in a long time has been Hamilton. There are more young people who want to know about Aaron Burr, about all of this stuff, and so, and we are shamelessly using it, and many people are. So when we put online Eliza's last, uh, the letter from Alexander Hamilton to Eliza the last one, the responses we get from the young people are amazing. One uh, group of students asked me, are there any more cool dudes in history? Because <laughs> they want to know. And I said there were even some dudettes. <laughs> and, that, and that we have a hook. So with black history, one of the best um, descriptions that I've heard recently of how to connect young people with history came from, and I said we need to, to really capitalize on the popularity of this movie, uh, The Black Panther. And so many young people are going to it, record numbers. And uh, Dr. Ben Carson, who I had the uh, pleasure of uh, meeting and working with in Baltimore, where he was a renowned neurosurgeon and a champion for literacy, recently gave uh, an example of how to connect young people to black history and the facts that uh, we know about now. When a young person is, uh, let's say, they're getting ready to go to see Black Panther, and you tell them, when you turned on that light, did you know that Louis Latimer was the assistant 
to Thomas Edison and that filament was because of his invention. When you reach down to put on your shoes, that the last, as they call it, in your shoe was made by a black man and invented. And then did you know that when you went to iron your shirt that the ironing board patent was an African-American woman? And then when you open the door and a refrigerated truck goes by, did you know that a black man developed the refrigeration in trucks that allows for food to be transported. And then, oh, there's an ambulance going by, taking someone who needs blood transfusion. And Charles Drew was the first uh, person to uh, develop blood plasma. And then the person gets there and they have surgery, heart surgery. And the first person to do heart surgery was uh, a f black physician. And you make them realize, and then when they stop at the stoplight, that Garrett Morgan invented the traffic light. You take them through their lives and give them those examples. Now I think too, and being at the Library of Congress, I've had the opportunity to have what I call many pinch me moments. Uh, I mentioned the largest collection of maps, the first map of America called America's Birth Certificate. Uh, largest collection of comic books. When the Black Panther uh, movie came out, of course we tweeted about the first edition and the second edition and we have it and all of that. Uh, Branch Rickey's uh, scouting reports where he talks about um, Hank Aaron has potential <laughs> and, and uh, things like that. And one day I was going through the stacks and looking at some new shelving and, and looking at some of the collections. And I passed by Oliver Wendell Holmes and I passed by Thurgood Marshall and uh, Clara Barton and all of this. And then I saw Frederick Douglass. And when I stopped, I, I told the curator and the biggest joy of working at the Library of Congress beyond having the pinch me moments is the fact that you have staff members like Ms. Cannon and all of the curators who are just living and walking encyclopedias. And I said, oh, Frederick Douglass, wait a minute, are those Frederick Douglass's papers? Because being in Baltimore and in Maryland, you really get a sense of Frederick Douglass. But also my favorite quote is by Frederick Douglass, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. And so, in fact, we have it inscribed uh, on the library there. I got to pick that. And so I couldn't believe that there were, these were really his papers. And so here I am in the stacks. Four and some of my Library of Congress colleagues are with me, and they know this was pretty deep down in the stacks. And I pulled out, and this is the serendipity of history, and there's so much more to discover. Pulled out a box, one of the files, at random, opened it, and said, could I pull out a file? She said, sure. I pulled out the file and opened it, and there was Frederick Douglass's handwriting. And I have a, a family history of being uh, from Illinois and grew up summers in Springfield, Illinois, where Lincoln, everybody knows Lincoln. We went to the log cabin, we know the whole thing. We were Lincoln all the way. And I opened it up, and there in Frederick Douglass's hand, in other words, Abraham Lincoln was a plain man. Abraham Lincoln was a simple man. And then he was murdered, assassinated, and killed. And you could feel, and every time he mentioned Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln being murdered, assassinated, killed, or you could feel it coming through the page because he was emphasizing it because of the colored man. And that one of the greatest tragedies was that at his memorial in the Capitol, the people who owed him so much were not allowed to pass by his casket. And I stood there and I thought, oh my God, this is a pinch me moment. This is what we want more people to have. This is discovering black history and history that is just waiting there. Professor Morris's uh, book 
emphasizes the discovery part that's still there. There are still archives. There are still papers waiting to be looked through. There are still opportunities to have and engage young people in being history detectives. They love forensics. They love all of these things. The best thing we could do is to, to turn them on to history and to let them make discoveries. I thought about what Dr. Woodson uh, did for so many of us. He helped us realize that history is something to be discovered, but also something to be embraced in a way that we really can't, uh, it, it's, it's almost emotional. And as a person who's had the opportunity to be in those stacks, to see Thomas Jefferson, uh, professor uh, with the culinary arts, to see Thomas Jefferson's recipe for macaroni and cheese <laughs> that he brought to the United States, and, and know that, and, and then the notes from his chef, James Hemings, Sally Hemings' brother, who he took to France and had that, but to see those markings and that. And also, he made a pasta machine, and we have that draft. Look, she's, you should see her, her eyes are like, <laughs> this is culinary, wait till you, we have the largest collection of cookbooks to it, so you have to come and visit. But to, to realize that you can have that hands-on history, and that's what we need to preserve. So I just, to the synergies with Dr. John Hope Franklin, University of Chicago, who was really an acolyte of uh, Carter Woodson's and one of his students. I had the opportunity to meet him and to see what the embodiment of black history could be. I think about what is still ready to be put online. The Ralph Ellison archives, his personal library with his inscriptions in every book. And then another pinch me moment, a letter of introduction from Langston Hughes to Richard Wright for Ralph Ellison saying, you should meet this young man. So I want to thank you and thank uh, Marshall for letting me share some time with you today um, and to think about what black history means and that you should be so, so very proud here in Huntington that the father of black history, there was something I passed by, uh, Professor Morris uh, took me by last night, the statue that's there okay, on the street, not far from here. Halgrove Boulevard. And you have Carter Woodson looking across the street at the high school, Douglas High School that he went to, and I think he was the principal there too, he came back. And that, yes, Senator, you should own it <laughs> because this is where black history was born in that sense. That, when you look at that statue and you know that his house, his family lived there, where they're public housing right now, his family, what was it? Something in the water, <laughs> something here that made him have that fire and that made him want to bring black history to all of us. So I want to thank Huntington and for, for making sure that Carter Woodson became who he did, and also for making it possible for people like me to embrace it and want to share it with so many people. So thank all of you, and thank you, Professor Morris. Now I understand we have, oh, before I stop, I have to give a special thank you, though, to uh, Mr. Smith, who designed this wonderful stage. Yeah. Um, he, Is it, it is Mr. Smith? Yes. 
Okay, where is he? Because he is the director of this wonderful performing arts center. And last night when we came to look, he, I said, uh, so what's the setup? And he said, well, there'll be, a, you know, <laughs> stage and they'll have the black curtain here and everything and some flowers. Well, then I come in today and look what he did. <laughs> and this is from the Performing Arts Center's own library that they have. And he carefully curated that. So I just want to thank him so much for that. This is truly wonderful.